So you're, everyone, you're very, very welcome for this, even, this evening's webinar. Um, and this, this, this evening's webinar kind of finishes off a, a month of breast cancer awareness. As you all, you all might know, um, October is Breast, breast Cancer Awareness Month. And myself and Ter Councillor Teresa Costello have been working um, before October, but we, we've really been working and um, highlighting it this, this month of awareness. Um, our goal really is to empower men and women to be more aware on their breast, breast changes, their breast health, make people more aware of the causes of breast cancer and to acknowledge those who we have lost due to breast cancer and to give hope to those who are who are currently going through treatment and who acknowledge all the work that um, our excellent doctors and researchers are doing for people who with breast cancer and indeed um, all types of cancer because there is an incredible amount of work going on out there at the minute so it is really uh, it's really a huge privilege of mine to have this expert panel of of um of guests um professor william gallagher professor roshan Connolly, and dr eleanor galvin um, i'm going to hand you over to Teresa. Councillor Teresa Costello now for, for her introduction and she can she can give you a highlight of why she's part of this campaign or why she's heading this part campaign. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks, Erin, and thanks everybody for attending and thanks speakers for attending also. I really appreciate you giving your time tonight. Um, I was 36 when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I had no knowledge of how to be breast aware, so I didn't know the signs and symptoms of breast cancer. I didn't check myself, nor did I know how to. I found a lump by chance when I was in the shower and I visited my GP who referred me to St. James's Hospital. I presented that day with three tumours and severe indentation and my consultant knew by just looking at me that I had cancer and that day I was told to bring somebody back with me the following week because I would be being told I had cancer. From the moment I entered St. James's Hospital the level of care I received was excellent. I underwent chemotherapy, radiotherapy, a mastectomy, and an auxiliary clearance of my lymph nodes. To this day, I take a medication called tamoxifen, and I will be on it for the foreseeable future to help prevent a reoccurrence. It was down to the advancements in medicine because of research and the care I received by the medical professionals that I still, that I'm healthy today and made a full recovery. Breast cancer is a really lonely experience. So after my treatment, I set up a support community called Breast Friends to help support people emotionally who are affected by breast cancer. That can be friends, family, loved ones and patients. And um, it's a place where they can ask me questions and um, because I've been there and wore the T-shirt. And um, that's enough about me. I just want to introduce you to our first speaker tonight. My friend, Dr. Eleanor Galvin. Eleanor graduated from UCC in 1997 and has worked in GP practice since 2002. She also worked for eight years in health check in the Matter Private Hospital in health screening. She has her own practice in Raffarnham since 2011, where she continues her interest in health promotion, preventative medicine and wellness. Eleanor, go first. Thanks, Teresa. I'm delighted to be asked here today by Teresa. Um, I'm only going to talk about the overview of kind of our experience of breast cancer and breast awareness in um, GP land. I have no fancy slides. This is all um, generalities of what happens when people come um, and how we decide who to refer uh, the pathway to care and, and what happens after that. So I would say that, first of all, most people who come uh, present with a lump, they present extremely upset. Uh, and extremely worried. Um, the reality is that most women um, our age, younger and older, have had a friend who's had breast cancer or know somebody who's died of breast cancer. So they're coming with that worry. And quite often they'll get up on the couch and they'll say, I think I have a lump, um, I have three children, and these things are all going through their heads at the time. Um, so while I was speaking generalities, most women who come to us with lumps or changes in the breast who are young present early and appear relatively aware of when they ought to come. Uh, we have found over COVID that an awful lot of older people have come later um, to be seen because they have worried about coming into surgeries and the risk of getting COVID 
and thought, well, COVID will be over another six weeks, COVID will be over another six weeks, and we've been putting these things off. Over the last year, we've had 12 women under 50 in my practice diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, and quite a few over 50. But I would think that we are probably picking up more younger people than we used to. Um, so the first thing that we do when they come is we do a full examination of them. Um, and then we also show them how to examine their own breasts. And we always try and take the opportunity to do that so that they're aware of how to do a proper breast examination and how to go up into the armpits, how to check it properly. Um, and, and that piece is extremely important. We also have uh, leaflets, um, which we get from charities that we give out uh, about uh, reminding people there's some that you can hang in your bathroom to remind you to do it yourself every month. And we also take that opportunity to take a full history about their family uh, if they have a history of cancer or a history of breast cancer and um, that we will be aware of that when we be making our decision as to who to refer on. Now I would say our threshold for referring on is quite low. Anyone who comes with a discrete breast lump is referred on uh, and what we are doing is screening out the people who have um, maybe skin issues on their breast, itch, um, dry skin, cysts, are other things that are not discrete breast lumps. And when I'm saying cysts, I'm saying skin cysts, not breast uh, abscesses. Um, but anything that is, we can definitively say 100% is not a breast cancer, that is the only thing we don't refer on. Uh, we do refer on all discrete breast lumps. And then it's the time to manage people's expectation because you now have a very upset patient who has a breast lump who is being referred on depending on whether or not they have a family history, they could be waiting between two and maybe eight weeks to be seen in a breast clinic. Some women don't fare terribly well during this period and they are extremely stressed. And some of them can even need to be signed off work because um, they can't cope with the uncertainty, um, which can be very understandable. Um, once they get into the system, the system is amazing. Uh, but it's that bottleneck at the beginning. And it's for us to try and balance uh, our threshold for sending people to the breast clinic um, and try to screen out the people who are really high risk and get them in as quick as we can um, and, and, and to manage the expectation. In this last year, I've had three people who've travelled home to their own countries for breast screening uh, because two weeks, four weeks was too long. They felt too late, um, which will tell you um, the stress that people feel when they're, when they're undergoing this process of finding a lump and, and being referred on. So our role kind of in summary is to do a small bit of gatekeeping um, and balance the demands from the public um, who come with breast lumps, which they ought to come with breast lumps, um, to do a little bit of education and make sure that we don't give any false reassurances that when somebody comes with a lump that we would write it off and say, well, that's fine, or I'm 99% sure it's fine. We need to be sure when, when we decide what to do with people. We're also involved in the management of people's care when they're undergoing treatment for breast cancer. And quite often people will come with um, menopausal symptoms because um, they're on medication that will induce um, uh, a low estrogen level in them. And those people we can't give HRT to, but we can do a lot of things to manage hot flushes, night sweats, things like that with other medication. Also, quite a few people are depressed or anxious going through these times, and we can do a lot to support them. And that is how I met Teresa, uh, because Teresa runs Best Friends, who has supported a huge amount of my patients um, over the last many years. With that social and emotional support, they can talk to other people who've been through it. For a lot of people, it is just six months a year out of their life of treatment and a hard time, but that they can see that maybe there's a lot of good life ahead. Um, and that sort of thing is absolutely invaluable for them. They also get advice on where to get wigs or things like that, that maybe we don't know all about having not been through it ourselves. And um, there's also all sorts of other small things that happen to people during that time, like dry eyes, teeth problems, tingly feet, all those things where us as GPs can give them advice. There's nothing like getting the advice from other people who've been through it to help them. And also they will meet up for coffee, they have all these sort of um, little groups made, um, true links that they've made in Teresa's group. Um, I would also say that um, of all the of all the things people come in to be us worried about, um, when people come in with a lump and are told they're waiting six weeks for breast screening, which I know how hard people are working inside in hospitals, 
it is to them the end of the world. Whereas if they're coming in and they have a heart problem and they're told they have to wait four months for a cardiologist, they're not as worried. Um, there's also not a, a lot of um, fear amongst people who have family history of breast cancer um, and wanted to be in screening programs. Um, and I suppose also it's our responsibility to also educate women, not only about checking themselves, but also about um, looking at things that make them more at risk from cancer. So when people come in who maybe are drinking a little too much uh, or are overweight, not that it's going to give them cancer, but that all those sort of things can contribute towards cancer. It's not a popular discussion to have, uh, but it's one that's important to talk to people about managing their risk and their lifestyle um, to minimize their risk of, of breast cancer and other cancers. Um, I, I think that despite the outcomes um, and results being so well, it is an incredibly worrying time for women. Um, it's also hard for them to balance wearing their families, having maybe sometimes um, problems with their jobs, not being able to attend. Um, and we often have to liaise with employers to uh, reason that people need time off work um, and they need time off work, maybe not just for the time of their treatment, but for some time afterwards to recover and also get their energy back. Um, um, I would think that that's all I have to say at the moment, um, but I, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about it uh, and to have everybody checking their breasts every month um, and to have an awareness of their own family history um, is, is an important thing. Thank you very much, Dr. Galvin. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot of information there, so thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, and that is Professor Roisin Connolly. is a impre very incredibly impressive, impressive lady. Uh, Professor Connolly um, is a medical oncologist at Cork University Hospital and a clinical researcher with, with expertise in clinical trials in breast cancer and, and, other, and other cancers. She was also appointed as the Professor Gerald O'Sullivan Chair in Cancer Research at University College Cork in late 2019 after over a decade overseas in the, the world-renowned John Hopkins in Maryland, USA. So, for, 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 Professor, it is an incredible honour to have you here this evening, like all our speakers, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Erin. I'm just going to share my slides now. Can you see that there? Yeah. Great, okay. Well, look, thank you so much for having me here this evening. It's fantastic to see so many on the call. Um, uh, so, so, you know, so late in the evening and heading into the Halloween weekend. So delighted that, that some of us can join you this evening um, to give a little bit of perspective on um, breast cancer. Um, and my, my uh, portion of this will focus more on the treatment um, and a little bit about the diagnosis when people are heading into the hospital. Um, after being referred in um, from GPs like uh, like Dr. Galvin, um, and as a as Erin mentioned, I'm a medical oncologist in Cork University Hospital, and I have um, a great position there, which is a position which allows me to both um, look after patients in the hospital um, for about fifty percent of the week, and also to um, have my foot on the research side uh, with University College Cork. And so just a very brief introduction, um, because it's important to know um, about some of these details as to how important breast cancer is. And um, in Ireland, about one in 10 women will develop breast cancer over their lifetime. Um, and we have over 3000 women diagnosed every year in the country. Um, the good news is, is that the majority of these women are diagnosed with early stage disease, which is curable. Um, and that will be over 90%. I think it's very important, and this was mentioned at the beginning, that we um, acknowledge that about 1% of breast cancer, so one in 100, occur in men. And so men should also be aware of changes in the chest area and bring this to attention. And this can actually be linked to a genetic um, abnormality um, in, in, their, in, their, in their families. Uh, and uh, just very important for men to be aware of that as well. And from a global perspective, um, there are unfortunately about a half a million deaths per year globally from breast cancer. So really, this is a very, very important public health um, issue. 
And um, similarly, in terms of the good news part of it, um, there have been significant improvements in survival um, over the last few decades. Now, this um, information is only to 2015. It's data from the National Cancer Registry, but you can see um, on the uh, on the top uh, of the graph, um, the red line. You can see slight. There was slightly. There was an increase in the incidence of breast cancer over time, which then steadies steadied out. And a lot of that increase um, was likely due to um, the uh, screening mammography coming in. Uh, and if you look at, at the lower uh, bars, you can see slowly the red dashed line, the mortality or death from breast cancer slowly decreasing over the years. Um, and another thing that's very important, which we won't talk about too much today, is what's called DCIS or in situ breast cancer, which really is a pre-cancerous condition. And you can see that the numbers of that are slowly had slowly increased also um, likely with the introduction of mammography as well and have sort of plateaued. Um, and luckily that's um, a condition which isn't cancer in itself, but can sometimes turn into cancer later, uh, such that we do treat it uh, with surgery and radiation and sometimes hormone therapy. And another important uh, set of facts relates to um, the five-year survival. Um, and the good news again is that the majority of women can reach the five-year mark and beyond um, over 80% and do well with a diagnosis of breast cancer, which can be different, unfortunately, to some of the other cancers that we treat. And you can see that if the cancer is localized, which means that it's just in the breast, we can have really close to 100% five-year survival. If the cancer is spread to the lymph glands, the uh, five-year survival reduces a little bit um, in the 70 to 90 range, and uh, for those patients who present with distant disease, which is also called advanced or metastatic or stage four breast cancer, um, unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do in this space where people are doing better with, with more treatment options, uh, but unfortunately, many will ultimately um, die from the disease. But again, we are managing patients better and better such that women are living to five and 10 and even, even beyond that uh, with that disease. But still over 700 women in Ireland are dying every year from metastatic breast cancer. And so lots of work to do. And when a, when a patient comes into the hospital into, um, into the breast check or into the symptomatic uh, breast service, um, there's a number of different tests that are done. It's called the triple assessment. There's the clinical breast examination, which Dr. Galvin mentioned, and that's done uh, by the GP initially, and then also by the surgeon, usually when the patient comes in or by the, or by the uh, radiologist. Um, and the, the um, mammography is the mainstay of treatment, but oftentimes if um, a lump is detected, uh, either by clinical examination or by the mammography, an ultrasound scan or jelly scan will also be performed to look a bit more closely um, and also to look at the lymph glands under the arm. And not in all cases, but in some cases, an MRI is also recommended. And usually on the same day, a patient, if they have an abnormality, uh, will have a needle biopsy uh, or needle aspiration or biopsy. And this is called the triple assessment where you have the clinical examination, the imaging, and the pathology evaluation. And um, the results of this are then discussed at a, a weekly meeting in our, in our cancer centers around the country where all the experts sit together and re review the information and, and determine if a patient has uh, breast cancer or the DCIS, or indeed, hopefully uh, they don't have, have those uh, diseases. And so this slide is to highlight really partly the very multidisciplinary team uh, that we have looking after patients when they enter the hospital uh, between our pathologists, our radiologists, our breast surgeons, um, and then they will also come to medical oncology and radiation oncology. And the timing of that sometimes depends on the type of cancer, the size of the cancer. Um, and um, some patients will actually get chemotherapy or other treatments before surgery. And that's when they will come to medical oncologists like myself earlier. And um, then they will have their surgery and then we'll decide on extra treatment afterwards. Um, some patients will have um, cancers that are better served by going straight to surgery and then they don't need the, the neoadjuvant or pre-surgical part, and we will make decisions for them after surgery. And then patients will go into a follow-up phase or surveillance phase 
where they're coming regularly for evaluation, um, history taking, examination and the annual mammogram uh, in the years after the diagnosis. And the goal overall here in early breast cancer is to, is to ultimately prevent future breast cancer events, to cure um, the disease. And also we need to be cognizant that we need to maintain a quality of life as well and manage symptoms with the treatments that we're offering. And breast cancer used to be felt to be just one disease, but it's now subdivided um, into three main subtypes, which we use in the clinic to determine the treatment approach. And you can see here uh, the HER2 at subtype is 15%. Um, and you can see with this pie chart here, I haven't got all the details, but it's being subdivided further and further with newer technology um, into what we call intrinsic subtypes. And it might be that in the future, our treatment is not really um, decided by these subtypes, but by even more intricate um, subdivision of breast cancer, which might be more personalized. Triple negative breast cancer is about 15%. That's where we don't have any of the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, or the HER2 receptor to target. And the majority of our breast cancers are hormone receptor positive. And you can see on the left-hand side, the main backbone of treatment for these cancers, the endocrine therapy for the hormone positive, the HER2 directed therapy for the HER2 positive cancers, which is usually combined with chemotherapy. And then for triple negative breast cancer, we often use chemotherapy and newer targeted therapies and immunotherapies now coming on board and always considering supportive care uh, when we're managing patients and also considering if there's any clinical trial options available to provide the newer treatment approaches. I'm going to just mention briefly the treatment, um, a little bit about the treatment of the hormone receptor subtype and the HER2 subtype um, initially. And this is a sort of a busy slide, which is sort of just highlighting that there's lots of um, hormone pathways in our body. Uh, there's the estrogen and um, there's the aromatase enzyme. And we're basically acting on uh, these levels and also the estrogen receptor, uh, which you can see here uh, in the nucleus of the breast cancer cell. And when this is stimulated, the, the breast cancer cells can grow and proliferate. And so we're sort of blocking these receptors from signaling with either tamoxifen, which blocks directly at the level of the receptor, or with aromatase inhibitors, which change the um, conversion of hormones um, peripherally in the blood and uh, prevent them from being converted to estrogen. And then there are other um, drugs as well in the metastatic setting, which actually degrade or modulate otherwise the estrogen receptor. Um, now, it's very, very important for us to balance the benefit and the side effects of these treatments. But in general, these treatments are felt to be safe. Um, they don't have the, um, the chemotherapy side effects, but they do have quite troublesome side effects, which anyone who receives these will know. And these are oftentimes menopause related symptoms, such as hot flashes, uh, changes in um, vaginal dryness or, um, or sexual function, um, uh, weight gain, irritability, mood issues. And with the aromatase inhibitors, um, some of those similar symptoms, but also actually aches and pains that can be quite debilitating. Um, and there are other sort of more serious side effects that are very rare, but we do counsel patients about those. So we're, we can reduce the risk of the cancer coming back with these treatments, but we can also cause um, some side effects. And it's important that we recognize these side effects. And I'm very lucky to be part of a, a pilot um, clinic in CUH at the moment, which is supported by the Irish Cancer Society and also with some support from Breakthrough Cancer Research, which um, in which we're enrolling women um, who have come out of their chemotherapy, come out of their radiation, starting their hormone treatment. And we have a nurse led clinic where one of our research nurses, Kate, um, meets with the patients and also one of our dietitians, Andrea, to give a sort of a formal evaluation, a survivorship plan, education. And then those patients are followed in slightly different ways in the following year to see can more more intensive um, monitoring of their symptoms improve ultimately the outcome for patients. And so we're really happy that we have this trial available to patients in Cork at the moment and hoping to extend it to other centers. And on the HER2 side, again, this is the 15% of patients. Uh, we we um, diagnose this with very simple um, uh, pathology tests. Um, and this is sort of some images of what the pathologists will see under the microscope as they diagnose HER2 positive breast cancer. And really um, in the past, this was a poor prognosis breast cancer. But um, uh, 
over a decade ago, um, a new treatment came on, on board, uh, trastuzumab, which was a HER2-directed therapy. And this treatment was developed, and the, the initial um, development of this was in the laboratory. And basically, basic scientists or laboratory-based scientists were working closely with the clinicians, finding out what the real problems were in the clinic. And ultimately, this led to the development of this drug, trastuzumab or Herceptin, which significantly changed this disease. And you can see here in this Kaplan-Meier curve, which might be sort of um, difficult for some, but essentially there was an 18% difference in the recurrence um, in women who were receiving um, the trastuzumab. So that's 18 extra women in 100 treated with these um, treatments who were spared the cancer coming back. But that was only the first step. And since then, we've had extra treatments. We have pertuzumab now approved in the, in the neoadjuvant or pre-surgery space. And we have um, more treatments that are probably soon to be approved. One is TDM1, um, a mono, um, an antibody drug conjugate, which is very close to being approved here in Ireland. But unfortunately, we are very delayed in that approval due to our systems. And, and I would have been using that in the US before I left there over two years ago for patients. So very keen to get that on board so we can reduce even further uh, the risk of cancer coming back in, in this rare subtype. Um, and an, an even newer uh, drug that, that we have available very shortly in clinical trials around the country, and actually the, this clinical trial is already open in the Matter Hospital as one example, is the use of the, the agent trastuzumab derex tecan, another very new drug, um, which seems to be even better possibly than TDM1. And so we have clinical trials now opening um, across the country uh, with this drug, which we again hope will improve outcomes. And I have the title of this slide as reaching the ceiling of benefit. We have done so well now in this cancer that what we're now trying to see is, well, does everybody need this treatment? Could we pull back and could we give less treatment for some women? Because all of these are associated with side effects and with cost issues and obviously the burden of having to come in for the treatment. And so uh, one clinical trial that I was um, uh, involved with that I led and published and updated from this um, trial last year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology was the TBCRC 026 trial, where we actually gave women just the HER2 therapy pre-surgery, just the pertuzumab and trastuzumab. And we tried to see, could we identify women who might even be spared chemotherapy in the future? And we had over, over 80 women enroll in this, in this clinical trial. They just received the HER2 therapy, and then they would have received their chemotherapy if it was essential after surgery. And we, we found that very early changes in PET scans could actually potentially predict those women who might benefit from this type of chemo-free approach. And so really, I think the way the future is, is that we will tailor treatment to the individual. And that's a term called precision oncology. So there may be patients who don't need any Herceptin or any chemotherapy. There might be people who need the HER2-directed therapy alone without the chemo, and that's a very non-toxic approach. And we know now that there are some women who can get the HER2-directed therapy with just one chemotherapy, and that's a shorter, a shorter course of chemotherapy uh, that has really less, uh, far less side effects than some of our other combination regimens. And then some, of course, will need these aggressive approaches where we have these new agents. And again, just mentioning a few of these clinical trials, which are opening across Irish sites, looking at both the escalation approach, making things even better for those who really need it, who have aggressive disease, or the, or the de-escalation approach where you're pulling back a little for those who may have smaller cancers. And then it's mainly focusing on the early breast cancer setting. And then in the advanced breast cancer setting, we won't have a huge amount of time to go into this, but I'll just mention that, that cancer is so complex. And so you can see in this, in this image here, unfortunately, in some women, the cancer can spread to the brain and um, it can spread to the liver, it can spread to the bone and it can spread to the lungs. And in that case, the goal of treatment is to prolong life to improve symptoms and to maintain quality of life. So the treatments that we use, we want to balance again the side effects with the efficacy. We want to try and ideally have treatments that give as few side effects as possible, but are really hard on the cancer. And this, um, this is a, a sort of a, a schema of how complicated cancer is um, from scientists Hannahan and Weinberg, who, who showed us how many different pathways and abnormalities there are in cancer. And only recently we've had uh, new um, drugs across cancer types affecting the immune system, harnessing the immune system to fight cancer. We've also had PARP inhibitors um, targeting genomic instability, in particular in patients with BRCA mutations. And we've also had these cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors or CDK inhibitors really change the treatment paradigm again in patients with hormone 
receptor positive advanced breast cancer. So, so much research ongoing. And this is a slide actually that Professor Gallagher um, brought to my attention, which is really fantastic. Actually, this is advances in 2021 alone, um, covering both early breast cancer and late stage breast cancer with the PARP inhibitors and um, the immunotherapy and um, the antibody drug conjugates, the TDXD or trastuzumab derex tecan, um, abemacyclib in the adjuvant setting and newer agents in the metastatic setting. And so there has been just this plethora of new drugs coming through with some of them already approved by the FDA, some of them approved by the EMA. And um, I think all of these are actually pending in Ireland uh, in terms of approval for these indications, but hopefully very soon, um, especially if we can advocate for that. And so, but none of these advances have, would have been possible without um, clinical trials, both internationally and in Ireland. And we're lucky that we have Cancer Trials Ireland and National Network which um, has clinical trials open at all of our major cancer centers and some of our satellite centers. And Cancer Trials Ireland has links to many international groups, including, for example, the Breast International Group and the ECOG Akron Group, which I'm heavily involved, it, involved with. And one of my colleagues, Seamus O'Reilly in Cork, has recently, recently been elected to the um, executive board of BIG, again, giving that fantastic Irish link to an international organization. And this is just some pictures of some of our team in Cork um, we have um, a clinical trials unit in COH. We have a partner um, unit in the Bon Secor, And we've recently also partnered with Waterford as part of a new HRB funded clinical trials cluster to try and bring more clinical trials to patients in our region, to try and increase the clinical trial accrual as high as we can so we can get these um, novel drugs available for patients to improve outcomes. And this is sort of, I suppose, my last slide, which leads into uh, Professor Gallagher's talk about why we should all be working together to try and bring these treatments and new diagnostics to patients for better decision making. And translational cancer research is when we bring ideas from the bench or from population health uh, questions um, to the bedside in the form of a clinical trial. And ultimately, if those clinical trials are successful, we bring the new treatment to patients, um, both nationally and internationally. And um, in Cork, I'm very lucky that we have a huge wealth of expertise in our School of Public Health, the National Cancer Registry locally, our ECAS group, which is a survivorship group in our School of Nursing and Midwifery. And then we have lots of basic science expertise, including microbiome expertise, technology expertise, and expertise in cancer biology in our School of Pharmacy. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to have these people work closer together, work with the clinicians, work with the patients to try and develop new clinical trials that really will impact outcome. And so I'll finish there. And I, I, I like this picture here of one of my patients from Baltimore and Johns Hopkins. This was a young woman um, who was a single mother. Um, she had uh, three small boys and was holding down a job and going to college in the setting of a lot of these side effects of treatment. Um, she had HER2 positive breast cancer went through all of her chemotherapy, her HER2 therapy, and then went on to combination endocrine therapy to try and maximize her chances of preventing the cancer coming back. And she had significant side effects, which had to be managed. But, you know, throughout the whole thing was so brave um, and, and came to her appointments, you know, and followed all the, the instructions in, in terms of her follow-up mammograms and anything that she was recommended. But a huge amount of support is necessary with our nursing colleagues, our clinical nurse specialists and the entire team. Uh, to ensure that we can manage um, this disease properly. So thank you so much for your time and we'll be delighted to join the Q&A uh, later. Thank you very much, Professor, and um, uh, wonderful to, to end on such a positive note, note um, to give us such hope because this is, it is, it's not, it's not all negative. Um, and you're, you're, it was almost a, at the start of your presentation, it was like a practical guide to what happens when you are in that system so again you know knowledge is power and if there is people um starting off on that course at the minute um that is actually the, the beginning of your, your your presentation was the practical guide of what happens to go um to the individual what is the process along the way and the different treatments so um I, um, absolutely fantastic and to end on such no, a, a positive note um, of hope uh, for for so many, so um, I want to so thank you for that. I want to our final speaker, Professor William Gallagher, 
And uh, Professor Gallagher is a full prof professor of cancer biology at the University College Dublin and has most recently acted as director of the UCD Conway Institute, one of Ireland's largest biomedical research facilities. From 2013 to 2019, he directed the Irish Cancer Society's first collaborative cancer research centre, Breast Predict, Predict, which brought together breast cancer researchers from bench from the bench to the clinic from Dublin, Cork and Galway. He is currently Deputy Director of Precision Oncology Ireland, a large scale national cancer research, research programme co-funded by Science Foundation Ireland under its strategic partnership programme. Precision Oncology Ireland, is, which is led by UCD, involves four other academic institutions, six cancer charities and eight companies and has a cross cancer focus. He was co-founder of the chief co-founder co and, chief, and chief scientific officer of Oncomark, a diagnostic company focused on delivering developing better tests to predict cancer patient outcome, which was acquired earlier this, this year. This his main passion is at present is to help drive forward the establishment of an all Ireland cancer research institute, along with multiple colleagues and stakeholders across Ireland and Northern Ireland. So, Professor Gallagher, it is a huge honour to, to to have you well, to have you speaking here this evening, and yeah. we'll we'll hand we'll hand the show over to yourself. Thank you. Okay, thanks. At least you didn't give my birth weight anyway, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, uh, so, um, first of all, thanks very much, uh, Senator McGreen, McGreen and Councillor Coslow for for inviting us to give um, the presentations. Uh, I'm just going to try and share my screen. So hopefully uh, you can see my slides, maybe give me a thumbs up. Yeah, great. Yeah. So look, um, what I was trying to do is follow on from Professor Connolly's presentation and give you a flavor, I suppose, what we're doing in an Irish context uh, in terms of breast cancer research, particularly in this area of translational cancer research. And again, as indicated, I suppose probably the most important thing I've th I think I've done in my career to date has led to this program called Breast Predict, which I'll talk specifically about. And this was a massive program, which was, um, funded fully by the Irish Cancer Society over a period of six years and it accounted for a very significant investment from, from the, the charity over that time period and funded essentially a team of about 35 people across Ireland, a lot of emerging uh, cancer researchers which are actually dotted all over the globe now in terms of uh, cancer research uh, and also some still currently in Ireland and then you know these, these individuals will at some point, point come back to Ireland and, and enrich what we're doing here. Um, let's click on. Yeah, I, I just have some disclosures to make. I do have a, a, a side commercial interest, and I do have an interest in trying to, I suppose, bring technologies to patients. You do need companies to do that. So I suppose a starting point for Breast Predict was uh, the late John Fitzpatrick, who was a noted urologist, and he was the first head of research for the Irish Cancer Society. Uh, unfortunately, died a number of years back, and. He had this vision really out there really to really bring people together from multiple disciplines, you know, bring the people, you know, like myself, wearing the white lab coat in, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, the geeky scientists in the lab, together with, you know, people like uh, Professor Connolly, who's kind of directly facing the patients, can, can we work together, but also, you know, people working with mathematicians, working with people kind of in different areas. Can we come together in a team-based approach in terms of answering uh, you know, a small number of key important questions in terms of uh, uh, cancer research. And so we, uh, we were the first uh, collaborative cancer research center to be funded. Um, and I suppose uh, we were funded over a period of six years. Uh, and I suppose our vision at the time was really make personalized medicine, the concept that Professor Connolly introduced, make it a reality for breast cancer patients in, in Ireland and elsewhere. And again, I think you know, we already have a degree of precision or targeted medicine in breast cancer. There's some very good examples that Professor Connolly has highlighted, but we need to find more. We you know she talked about the kind of subdivision of breast cancer into these complex subgroups. Again, we need to be able to treat those kind of different subgroups, identify them and treat them appropriately. And so uh, again, it was a big team that was funded, um, a very significant investment. It was like 30,000 euro per week, which was kind of told to me on a, a, common, a common occasion by um, Professor John, John Kennedy, who's a, a noted medical oncologist in St. James's Hospital. And this was, uh, you know, again, what we're talking about is a very significant investment, 7.5 million euro over six years. This was coming from 
you know, significant fundraising, you know, people putting coins in, 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 in buckets in Daffodil Day, you know, you know, it's a lot of very significant investment and we had to make sure that we translated that into something of use. And so this funded a, a network of, of researchers from both the clinic and, and non-clinical side. You know, some of them you will be familiar with, like Professor John Crown, who was also a senator back in the day. We actually used to have some of our meetings in Leinster House. And then we have we we would have researchers again dotted around the country in in, in Cork, Dublin, and um, Galway. And again, also importantly, you know, we have six academic institutions involved, but also critically, Cancer Trials Ireland, which is an all island entity that Professor Connolly introduced in terms of cancer trials. We had six key goals, and again, you know, the key thing was keep our kind of questions orientated around kind of key key questions which were important to patients. You know, examples of that would be, well, what impact did prior medications or previous medications have on breast cancer outcomes? So, for example, you know, we know that a lot of individuals might take statins um, or other medications. What impact does that have on the type of breast cancer that is presented and also the outcome of individuals with a, a, a breast cancer? Another key question is, you know, we may have initial response to treatment, for example, either endocrine therapy or HER2 targeted therapies. But the challenge is that patients may present with a relapse and, be, and become resistant to that initial therapy. And our goal was really to try to understand why that happened. And if we can understand why it happens, then we can develop an approach to circumvent it or treat it. And so that was really one key, key goal. But the key idea here is kind of use kind of clever approaches, maybe use computer-based approaches or you know, computational approaches to kind of make it faster. Because one of the challenges for drug development it classically used to take 15 years and probably over two, you know, it used to be a billion, but it's probably over two or three billion to develop a drug. It's a very inefficient process and we need to become cleverer and faster about doing that. The other key question is, and again, I think, you know, uh, is, is the concept of prediction. You know, I think uh, Dr. Galvin talked about the anxiety that patients feel in terms of waiting for results and waiting for the information and knowing what's going to happen. You know, once a person is presented with, with, with breast cancer, particularly, for example, early stage breast cancer, you know, um, a key question, particularly if they're hormone receptor positive, is do I need, uh, uh, you know, you're going to get hormone therapy, but do I need chemotherapy? And, uh, you know, is my risk of recurrence low enough that I stand, you know, maybe I can do perfectly well with hormone therapy alone? And I'll comment about that later. So this is a kind of summary slide we've used in terms of achievements. And again, the, the impact of Breast Predict will be felt many years down the line, but you know, it was a six year program. And at the time in September, 2019, I suppose some of the kind of, uh, uh, kind of metrics we, we developed, like we, we, we had been able to develop and, and test uh, uh, over 17 different novel therapeutics. Some of those have reached the clinical trial phase and a number of different diagnostic uh, tests are, uh, were developed. Again, we had initiated a lot of partnerships. We also facilitated a number of translational studies and a few clinical studies. And again, a key aspect was a training of individuals and, 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 and progression of research. And I was going to pick out, I picked out four examples from a research, uh, uh, concrete examples of, of what came out of it. There's many, many other examples, but just to kind of give you a kind of a concrete example. And so just a flavor of some of the advances, uh, for example, Professor Leone Young, who's a, a translational cancer researcher in the College of Surgeons, she had done some basic research, you know, laboratory research to try to understand why, you know, certain tumors actually spread to different organs. So, for example, why it might go to the brain or to the bone. And she uncovered a mechanism underpinning that. And that now has been funded into, there's a, a recent funding that she's acquired to actually uh, progress that into a clinical trial phase. Um, I'll talk a bit about this idea of reducing unnecessary treatment for early stage breast cancer patients. And again, I think the subgroup that uh, Professor Connolly didn't really talk about much was triple negative breast cancer. I think she talked about ER positive breast cancer and HER2 positive. The challenge is, uh, significant, there is a significant challenge in the area of triple negative breast cancer is 15% of patients. And the, and the name doesn't really, you know, it's, it, it's not a great name either. You know, it's, 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 it has negative in the title. And that's really refers to the absence of this estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2, these, these drug, you know, these druggable targets. And so uh, traditionally, until recently, the mainstay has really been chemotherapy, but that's starting to change in terms of potential use of immunotherapy and other therapies like PARP inhibitors uh, in that context. So a shameless plug for the work that, that we've done, but in collaboration with uh, 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 
Adrian Bracken, who's a really clever uh, scientist in Trinity College Dublin, and then Fiona Lanigan, who worked, was a PhD student in my lab and then did a postdoc in Adrian's group. Uh, about six years ago, we came up with a concept of, uh, again, there is already existing tests out there. People have used, like, for example, what's known as the Oncotype DX test, which is offered to patients uh, uh, commonly with early stage ER positive breast cancer in Ireland, uh, really to try to come up with a, a prediction of risk of recurrence. And so we came up with a concept of kind of, uh, I suppose, developing a test that actually could be done locally at the hospital site instead of actually sending out the sample out to California or to outside Ireland. This can be done locally within the same day as opposed to waiting you know, one to two weeks for a result. And also potentially a more accurate test. It's a good test, on, uh, the Oncotype DX test, but it potentially could be improved. So we essentially developed a test called Oncomaster, which can actually be used to predict whether e ER positive patients can, can forego therapy. And essentially we uh, did a side-by-side -side, uh, performance evaluation versus the kind of the key test that's out there in an Irish and international context on Type DX and showed that it was superior. Uh, and then it, this was done and uh, essentially validated across multiple uh, patient cohorts, across multiple jurisdictions, both uh, you know, in Ireland, UK, Sweden, and Austria. And essentially it's, 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 it re received the high, near the, one of the highest levels of evidence for a biomarker, what's called level 1B. So this test hopefully should be clinically available in about a year. I think it's the, the actual test is being finalized in terms of development by another company. Uh, Professor Brian Hennessy is a medical oncologist like Professor Connolly. He came back from, again, you know, one of the things that we're very fortunate in Ireland is the, the medical oncology community. If you look at it, you know, I think there's 40 medical, I'm not sure the exact number, it's about 40 medical oncologists in Ireland. Most of them have been trained in the top five uh, cancer treating centers in the US, like MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Johns Hopkins, et cetera, like uh, Professor Connolly. So we have probably the, some of the best trained medical oncologists in the world in terms of per, 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 per population, but we probably need twice as many. And um, Professor Hennessy came uh, trained in MD Anderson, um, did amazing work there and he came back a number of years back. And he focused specifically on why these, why HER2 positive breast cancers, unfortunately in the subset of patients, develop resistance to initial therapy. And he uncovered in the lab, he uncovered a mechanism, another kind of pathway another driver called PI3 kinase that's activated in, some, in these patients which become resistant. And so the idea is you can potentially drug it. So if you combine the two treatments, maybe you can overcome resistance. So he showed that in the lab. And then actually what was amazing was he actually initiated a, a kind of world leading clinical trial in Ireland. It wasn't like Ireland was following the other, other, other groups. It was initiated in Ireland by Professor Hennessy and his, and his work. And, um, the initial data for this was presented quite recently, showing, showing potential uh, efficacy. Again, a couple of stories about triple negative, and again, it's, it's something that actually is quite personal to myself, uh, uh, but ultimately triple negative breast cancer, there's, there's, there's key requirements to kind of come up with. You know, it's a, it's a, comp, it's a complex, with 15% of breast cancers, but we know that that subgroup itself is a mixture of different uh, subtypes of breast cancer, even within triple negative. It's a kind of mixed bag. And Professor John Crown was a very noted, uh, probably one of the best unsung heroes of cancer research in Ireland. Not the radio Joe Duffy, but the Professor Joe Duffy, who I carried out my first cancer research project with in St. Vincent's. He was a biochemist in Vincent's and he carried out research as a pastime, essentially unfunded pastime, and was probably one of the best published researchers in the world. Um, he, uh, he and uh, Professor John Crown were a PhD student in Nisha Sinnott really identified one of the common alterations in triple negative breast cancer is in a gene called P53, about 80% of triple negative breast cancers have a defect in that gene. And you can have drugs which potentially can kind of change that defective form of P53 into kind of like a, a better or normal form. And uh, they showed uh, that they could combine this with standard chemotherapy. And I think they've been trying to initiate a clinical trial in that space, but they've uh, uh, hopefully this will, will progress into a clinical trial phase soon. So last example, again, from our work in collaboration with Professor Dan Darren O'Connor and a PhD student in my lab called Bo Lee. Um, so again, we focus on this specific, we identified, uh, also other groups identified this particular protein called CDK7 that is present in high levels in um, uh, triple negative breast cancers. 
uh, and we sh showed at high levels of this particular protein. You can see that this is a front cover of the journal called Cancer Research. It's an image from, from essentially this circle here that uh, is a, a piece of breast tumor. And essentially each dot is essentially, the brown dot is a, a tumor cell that has expressed that CDK7 protein. And so you can see lots of the tumor cells express that. And then, and then tumors which have high levels of that CDK7, unfortunately, they seem to do worse in terms of outcome. And there are, there are various different drugs now which have been developed to target CDK7. There's a number of different companies out there. And again, in this paper, we showed that these drugs have a, a degree of efficacy and there's ongoing clinical trials. For example, a company called Car Caric Therapeutics have just completed trials in the UK in both trip, triple negative breast cancer and an ER positive cancer, which have failed other treatments showing initial efficacy. And again, I think Professor Connolly talked about this concept of patient involvement. And again, it's a, it's a critical part. You know, he, you know, obviously Professor Connolly directly interacts with patients. You know, we don't as laboratory scientists, but ultimately it's very important that we all we engage with patients to understand needs. And so a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Amanda McCann, initiated the patient voice in cancer research about four or five years ago which is a kind of dialogue between patients and um, researchers. And what was interesting is about three years ago, I met with Kieran Briscoe, who might be on the call here, and I chatted to him about you know, my passion of mine, which was, well, why don't we all come together in Ireland and actually you know, work together in cancer research, you know, break down the boundaries? And that's really what um, I'm focused on now, the, you know, uh, breast predictive finish. And, you know, this is, the, this is my, my project that I've been trying to kind of push forward again with colleagues like Professor Connolly all across Ireland and, and Northern Ireland, which is to create an all-island cancer research institute, a virtual institute, cross-border program to reduce fragmentation, build critical mass, a big team-based approach across different cancers, uh, really uh, attract, you know, Again, more people like Professor Connolly back to Ireland, build up the system, uh, get us quicker access to therapeutics and bring innovations. And I'll finish off in this video, uh, which kind of summarizes the vision of, of ACRI. And it's, I'd like to thank um, Aidan Gillen, actually, who did the voiceover for it. I have a version of this with my voiceover, but I'm not as good as Aidan. So um, I'll, I'll go with Aidan for this one. On the island of Ireland, one in two people on average will develop cancer during their lifetime. People's lives change overnight. A cancer diagnosis brings huge worry and anxiety, not only to patients, but to their families also. We want to help patients live longer and better lives after their diagnosis. We will connect cancer researchers across the island of Ireland. We will work alongside patients to make sure that their voice is heard. By coming together, we can harness all of our different skills and expertise to better understand cancer, to develop more personalized treatment options, to ease suffering and save lives. This is our vision for the All Island Cancer Research Institute. We will work hard to uncover better diagnostics and treatments for patients. We will learn more about preventing cancer as well as tackling key issues related to living with and beyond it. We will become a global leader in cancer research and as a result, we will give much needed hope to patients and their families. Please join us in our mission. Okay, and that's this is my last slide. I suppose what we're trying to do is, in terms of ACRI, uh, the, the, this All Island Cancer Research Institute concept, which also dovetails what's happening at a European level, is really focus on a number of key areas. You know, the key area of cancer prevention, which I think Dr. Galvin referred to in terms of, I suppose, lifestyle choices that people might make, earlier diagnosis, and then making sure that we can kind of I suppose there's huge advances in terms of diagnostics, but can we actually bring them into the clinic? Can we bring them forward? Uh, the important area of survivorship, we have over 200,000 people in Ireland who have had a, an experience of cancer, living with an experience of cancer, either with cancer or post-cancer. And there's various different issues uh, that, that we have to kind of consider. And again, I suppose the area that we focus on is really, I think this idea of tailoring treatments, more targeted treatments, and that's, again, people, a lot of people talk about the cost of cancer treatment, it's very expensive, they talk about, but ultimately, if you look at the, um, it's about not so much 
you know, giving expensive drugs, it's giving drugs to the, to the most relevant populations. And it actually has a cost saving if you actually do that. So it's not a cost burden um, if you actually do it effectively. So that's, uh, that's it there. Thank you. If you have any more details, you can contact me. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I think uh, I, you can't watch the video and you can't listen to, 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 to your presentation without um, feeling almost emotional because I don't think there's any of us that are unaffected by family or personal by um, who who have lost people who have or who know people who have survived cancer. So you're the uh, particularly the All Ireland Cancer Research Institute to me is um, is such a, is a shining light. Um, and if anyone who wants more information on that, they should look back on the Oireachtas uh, Good Friday Agreement Committee from last Thursday, because there was an incredible, heartwarming um, and, and really inspiring presentation by uh, Professor Gallagher and his colleagues on that All Iron Cancer Research. And we lead, we'll be doing our very best to make sure that you get that funding for that re for that research institute. Um, and I can, you can rest assured that we will be pushing that uh, um, for on your behalf and also on all our behalfs because it's really really important for 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 all of us um it's not it's not just it's not just about um about just a, a project for yourself it's a project for all of ireland and indeed the world we've had a lot of questions um which is fantastic um and i suppose i'm going to go kind of go maybe on the the chronologicalness of um if that's a word on on, on the question and there has been one question here on um I come in here on about early detection and there is uh, it's more focused towards the first part of it's more focused towards uh, Dr. Galvin and that's on early detection and um, what more can be done to assist GPs and the entire system I presume that's the, the system as it, as, it, as it goes on into the into the into the hospital setting entire system in order to assist with early detection um, and would reducing the age of breast screenings help? Um, and also what is associated with that is, has there been any research done on this, done on the, on the state, on the severity or the stages of breast cancer diagnosis on younger patients due to the fact that there might be, you know, not as, they're not in the breast check screening program. So, you know, is, is there, uh, a difference in the severity if the if the patient is younger and they might not have you know got got checked or breast checked um or diagnosed at an earlier stage. So is there a link between that that severity and and not being in the breast screening program? Um, there, there may not be. So I'm, I'll put that out to to yourselves if there's any takers on that. Dr. Galvin, have you any on the, you know, I, I, was, I, I was going to say that uh, the first part of my question was about um, the encouragement of people to do self screening. And I think that totally comes down to education. And it also maybe goes back nearly as far as schools that women would be breast aware from teenage years and uh, that they would be taught about this in school the same way as they're taught about all sorts of other things in school. Uh, it seems to be one thing that's missing out and that would become part of it. Uh, any teenage girl right in the 20s to know what their own breasts feel like and then they will be the first person who will ever find the change uh, and they will present earlier and always presenting earlier is better and um, it doesn't necessarily then mean they'll need huge treatment or anything but the sooner you notice change in your own body the more likely you are um, to have it addressed quickly and, and, and properly and also about the lifestyle education around uh, the prevention of cancers smoking the drinking uh, weight, all those sort of things that can drive cancers of different types. But that, that sort of education is is extremely important. And, and and some people seem to miss out. And I'm always quite surprised when somebody in their 20s comes in and I say, have you checked, do you check your breasts? And they say, no, you know, or they come in and say, will you check my breasts? And I say, of course I will, but you need, you can do it yourself as well. Um, and if you find something, then, then come to me, absolutely. Um, but it is something that um, women should be taught about. Boys are taught how to check their own uh, test days in school. Girls aren't taught about how to check their own breasts. I find it very strange. I have teenage girls and teenage boys. Um, so I, I find that strange. Um, it's a strange omission. Absolutely. And 
on the on the screen edge, um, uh, is there Professor Connolly or Gallagher? Do you have any comments on 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 prognosis or severity of cases if on on younger patients, or is that is that you know what what would what would reducing the breast check age result in, or would it, would the cost benefit of the re reduction would that would that end up in proper gains for the patients? So um, I suppose the the issue of of um, breast cancer in younger women is very is a very specific issue um, because there are very unique challenges in those patients, you know, because of them being so young. Um, and so um, and there also is a suggestion that sometimes the cancers can be more aggressive. Um, so oftentimes, if we are seeing a patient in front of us who has a breast cancer at a young age, and I suppose we think particularly of women under the age of 40 and even more so women under the age of 35, if they're coming to us with a diagnosis of breast cancer, uh, we worry a little bit more, partly because they're young and also and, and there is a suggestion that sometimes those may be a bit more aggressive and also because they've got so many years to live, you know, decades and decades to live and we want to make the right choices for them. Um, it's not to say that every patient diagnosed at a young age has um, has a cancer that needs an aggressive treatment approach. Um, there are some young women who will present with very small cancers. Maybe they're in, they are in a, a screening program because of a family history or because of specific risk. Um, and if they are, those cancers can be picked up early and they may be managed very easily. Um, but I think in terms of presentation, you know, for, for patients at any age, it's... Um, the main categories of presentation are either screening, what we call screening, they're picked up on the mammogram, um, or symptomatic, which is where a woman feels a breast lump. And even sometimes in between mammograms, women can present with a breast lump, even though the last mammogram was normal. And that sometimes be can be because the cancer is actually growing a little fast. So um, there's no easy answer. When we, when we think about um, reducing the screening age, some countries have done that. Um, for example, the United States, uh, where I was for a long time, um, and the, the age there is, is 40 and above. Um, but there are certain groups with, that will say that really under the age of 50, we should consider um, the individual decision for a mammogram. Um, some women should definitely be having mammograms early, uh, depending on their own history, if they've got certain histories of breast lumps or breast cysts or you know, other, other problems if they have a family history and, in, and of course, if they have genetic um, predisposition to breast cancer or other risk factors. Um, the, the, the big question is, should every woman between the age of 40 to 50 be having mammogram and would we cause potentially more harm at a population level versus help a small number? Um, and that's why I suppose at the moment, both Ireland and the UK have, have, have aimed for that more 50 to, to 70 age group. Um, uh, and so it's, it's a careful discussion of the, the benefits and the downsides and then the cost. Um, but ideally, each woman should have an individual conversation with their GP as to their own background, their own concerns, and then the decision made, um, if that's helpful at all. Great. Again, it's, it's all about empowerment, isn't it, really? Um, and to know your body, know what's wrong, what's 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 normal and what's not. Yeah, it's um, thank you. Another question came in there, there and it was um, for Professor Gallagher. And he, they were wondering, where does it, you think that Ireland fits or is placed in terms of cancer research relative to other countries glo globally? And I suppose, you know, when we think such... Um, when you you mentioned the you know the forty oncologists there um, in, in your presentation, all coming from you know top five um, research and, and, and trained in top five places. So I suppose um, how how do, does Ireland? We always kind of tend to put ourselves down in Ireland. So I, I think we have we I think we have the best. Yeah, we're small, but we punch well above our weight. Uh, again, there's a kind of metric that's used. So I suppose the metric that's used in the kind of research commonly is papers, scientific papers. You publish them and they, they have different rankings. It's a bit like, uh, I don't know, like the top, top of the pops for, for journals, right? They've got different rankings and the top of, in, in Professor Connolly's field would be the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and, you know, in my field, it would be 
nature or science or something like that. But ultimately, if you if you look at the kind of cancer research in an Irish context and you map it, we punch well above our weight in terms of the, that metric, in terms of the quality of what we do. Uh, again, um, we have a number of investigators who are leaders on international uh, European Union programs in the cancer research space. Uh, um, um, we also have a strong interaction with the US National Cancer Institute. So there is a, a Ireland, Northern Ireland, US Cancer Consortium that my colleague, Professor Mark Lawler and the late Paddy Johnson in, in Queens were, were significant proponents of. And again, if you look at the, you know, the, the scientific director of the National Cancer Institute, uh, Bill DeHoot, he said that, you know, Ireland's really on the, can, on the global cancer research map, but we are small. There is still, you know, things to be fixed. Again, I mentioned the number of medical oncologists, there's a you know a career paths for for people on the laboratory side where there's challenges, but we do we have some excellent people, but also we're networked. You know, I suppose one of the things that we have uh, we're good at in an Irish context, we're good at networking and interacting. We have a global footprint. We're, we're spread all around the place, um, and that is important for cancer research because ultimately it's a it's a global effort. Either clinical trials or scientists work at a global level. You can see that with what happened in terms of the the COVID research, you know, you know what I mean, uh, what happened in terms of the global uh, aspects. So we do, we, we, we're good, but we could, could get even better. Brilliant. Um, and there's another question here, and I suppose it goes to, um, the, it was about the precision oncology and both uh, professors mentioned this pre precision oncology. And I, seen that, I think that, that there is a, we, we know people who have gone through cancer treatment in the past and that chemo is so, so tough. This precision oncology, I suppose, it, it gives a bit of hope to an awful lot of people that, you know, that, that, that get in and kill, kill everything with the chemo thing um, might not be as necessary. I, 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 forgive my, my, lay, my lay understanding of it, but this precision oncology seems, um, you know, a, a really shining light in how we move forward in cancer treatments. Um, and if you could give, um, uh, sorry, I'll give a little bit of information on how Ireland fits in that and, and in that global or that precision oncology, and where are we on the on the, the availability of that treatment in Ireland? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Professor Connolly can probably comment on it. But uh, so both Professor Connolly and I are involved in a program called Precision Oncology Ireland which is, uh, again, it's a, it's a large scale, currently funded program, which is across different cancer types, which is, I suppose, looking at developing different precision approaches and different cancer types. If you just take an example outside even breast cancer, you know, the area of melanoma, which is, you know, potentially rising at epidemic proportions as well in an Irish context. I remember actually a number of years back, I, I, I you know, there was, people presenting with, with melanoma would have very limited options in terms of treatment. Now it's exploded in terms of uh, immunotherapy options, having a very significant impact in terms of uh, treatment uh, and also targeted drugs which target specific mutations. So it almost had a kind of like, not overnight change, but a very significant impact. I think as Professor Connolly indicated that there has been a historical basis of, of, of that kind of, you know, the HER2 example is a classic example of um, targeted approach, but even becoming more refined now in terms of these different drugs which target HER2. Um, so uh, yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, you're dividing up the patient population into these subgroups, trying to enrich for, for, for you know, identify the biology and then treat the biology based on those subgroups. Uh, but there is challenges in doing that because ultimately you need to be able to kind of match the therapies with the kind of diagnostics more appropriately. So I don't know if uh, Professor Connolly wants to add. She, she's, she does it on a day-to-day on a, on a -day basis. Well, I, th I think we, we are already using precision oncology in the clinic to some degree, but we just want to do it more. So I suppose one of the big um, breakthroughs in the last decade has been um, the gene expression test, which Professor Gallagher mentioned, the Oncotype DX test, and other similar tests, where in patients with the hormone receptor positive cancers, um, if they <clears throat> have this test done, <clears throat> which is, is, is really just on the pathology that's already in the lab, so it's not an extra sort of burden for the patient, 
um, and the test is sent off to the US and it comes back and indicates whether chemotherapy might be helpful or not. And more and more, we're able to avoid chemotherapy in patients with the hormone receptor positive cancer. And then more and initially it was tested in patients where the lymph glands were clear. And now it's also been tested in where the lymph glands are affected. So even where we would traditionally have said, oh, we have to always give chemotherapy in this setting. Now, certain women, mainly the postmenopausal women, even if the lymph glands are affected, we can do this oncotype test and we can avoid chemotherapy in many of them because chemo is just not is just not the right choice for that patient. It's actually more focusing on the hormone approach and the radiation and things like that. And I just wanted to say, I suppose, as a follow on to are we are we leaders? You know, Irish patients were enrolled in those clinical trials. They were called the Taylor X trials trial and the R expander trial. And because Cancer Trials Ireland has links to the US in terms of the big international groups, we were able to open that clinical trial in Ireland. And Irish authors are, you know, listed on the major publications that are going out there. And Irish patients actually contributed to that uh, practice changing result. So we're already doing some of that in the clinic. We just want to do it even more in the other cancer types, um, you know, uh, down the line. As the follow on for that, out of the 900 clinical centers, it was like, I think it was the world's largest clinical trial, over 11,000 patients, I think, participated in Telerex mm -hmm. worldwide, 900 clinical sites. Of the 10 or so, I think it was 10 or 11 sites in Ireland, uh, St. Vincent's Hospital was second ranked, I think, out of the 900 clinical sites, or it was one, essentially three or four of the sites in Ireland were, were in the top 10 out of 900, even though we're a small country in terms of participation in that trial. And Irish patients were the first patients in Europe where uh, you could actually get access to the Oncotype DX test public patients within the public healthcare system four years before the UK. And again, that's down to the um, amazing medical oncology kind of work that was take, taking place here. Brilliant. Um, and I, before, I suppose there's another question, and there was other questions in and around the same, the same topics there, but... Um, on a different topic, and it's to, to yourself, Professor Gallagher, and um, what was the vitamin D and aspirin study? Uh, it was in your, yeah. Yeah, uh, so again, there is, there's some suggestions that, that you know, there's some work epidemic. So this is the idea of looking at population-based studies. So again, this work of uh, Professor Kathleen Bennett in the College of Surgeons and Dr. Ian Barron, the original kind of work was looking at patients who were taking low dose aspirin and they were able to actually mine data from the uh, national prescribing database where you can actually kind of link that information with the national cancer registry and there was some suggestion that maybe um, exposure to low dose aspirin pre breast cancer diagnosis had an impact in terms of the, the stage of breast cancer when it presented and potentially the outcome of, of patients who uh, no a, a modest impact uh, uh, in terms of uh, reducing this stage of progression and in terms of reduction in terms of uh, recurrence rate. Now, again, before people rush out and take low-dose aspirin, the key aspect of on breast predict was actually try to understand it and actually validate it. And that was what we were doing within breast predict was trying to actually do a prospe prospective study where you actually ask a question in advance and then try to address it. And the problem is, you need to be very patient because you need to wait for a certain time period to actually see if that works or not. So those studies are ongoing, but there is some suggestions that some other drugs can have an impact in terms of that, uh, in terms of positive or negative impact in terms of outcome. And I suppose we're trying to disentangle that. Um, and, but that takes a long-term long-term effort and kind of concerted effort to do that. Yeah, I might just jump in there just for a second, because uh, it is very important to, as, as, as Professor Gallagher has said, to understand the difference between what we call epidemiological data, yeah. where, you know, large databases are looked at, large population cohorts, and then transferring that to actually a clinical trial that might specifically answer the question. Yeah. So, um, in regards to aspirin, for example, we are just probably this month closing up accrual to a large UK study that we have been participating in called the ADD aspirin study. Um, and we have enrolled a lot of breast cancer patients around the country, people who come out of their radiation, their chemotherapy, and then they're going on to aspirin. Um, but that's a randomized study where half the women get a placebo and half the women get the aspirin because we don't know yet whether it's helpful. And of course, aspirin may be associated with other problems like bleeding or, you know, reactions and things like that. So a large study that's formally looking to see, does it actually help? 
is really important before any decisions are made. And um, again, uh, Cancer Trials Ireland has opened that study across multiple sites. We've accrued a lot of patients in Ireland to that UK effort, uh, but it'll take a little bit of time to learn. Now, that's that's giving the aspirin afterwards some of the work that Professor Gallagher's team was was looking at beforehand. If you're taking aspirin in the years before your diagnosis, does that change your outcome? So it's it's really teasing out the intricacies of this um, and, and, and the setting. And then in regards to vitamin D, I suppose in general, we think that people should have vitamin D levels checked and vitamin D replaced. And that's really a primary care or GP, um, you know, day to day um, management plan. And as, as breast cancer physicians, we should also be encouraging uh, patients to have their vitamin D checked and replaced. And then if people are taking hormone therapy with us, they have a potential impact on their bone strength over time. And so we we routinely uh prescribe calcium with vitamin D along with some of our hormone therapies to try and protect the bones and then follow closely again to make sure that we're not causing more harm than good with the treatments that we're giving. So quite a, quite, quite a, quite a challenging topic. And I would just say to, to anyone listening that if you're ever considering taking anything like that to bring the question to the GP or to the medical oncologist, because we have to make sure that it is the right choice for that individual, especially in light of their other medications, et cetera. Can I actually come in there on that as well? Um, one thing that um, I get w- within my community is people um, being recommended herbal remedies alongside their chemotherapy. And it, it, it irritates me, I won't lie, because I understand the risks involved with that. And, you know, you'll have people preying on people who are quite vulnerable at, at, a, at a very frightening frightening part of their lives and they're recommending them to drink this green juice with all this stuff in it and it can have contradiction with contradictions with their medication and I know when I was going through my my chemotherapy um and Professor Gallagher you mentioned them and I'm a huge fan it's uh, Professor Kennedy was my oncologist and I just well uh, and I can tell you now when when news broke that he retired and um, my community were you know devastated and everybody was so worried with who was going to who, whose safe hands were they going to be put into then but I know I daren't I daren't go, go into chemotherapy and tell um Dr Kennedy that I was after mm-hmm. taking some kind of a herb or some silly silly remedy that you know some people it's like fake news some people they want hope and they want something to cling on to and sometimes it, people who promote stuff um that's not advised by medical professions can can nearly give these people a a, a false hope and, and can actually do an awful lot of damage and you know I was told many stories about people who presented very very ill from taking stuff that they that they really I I always advise no matter what and my, my group isn't about giving medical advice it's it's emotional support but when I come across questions like that. I I wouldn't let somebody take, you know, vitamin C without contacting their their oncologist or their doctor or consulting with their pharmacist pharmacist first. And even on on tamoxifen myself, before I take anything or even consider taking anything, I I put a call through to my pharmacist. And that would be for anybody listening, a really, really important thing to remember do, do not think it's just okay to take anything. Stuff like turmeric and stuff that people think is really healthy and has all these benefits um, can actually, um, you know, interfere with medication. Um, there's um, lots of thank yous coming into, um, the settings are all direct messages, but an awful lot of thank yous coming into to the, to the chat box here. Um, I have to say, I've learned an incredible amount um, and we we were because of COVID, we're all we're almost familiar with a lot of these terms. Um, the the you know epidemiological and the 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 FDAs and the and the EMAs and we 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 are familiar, but to be f- more familiar with oh, more cancer cancer terms now is is again uh, knowledge is power, and it's great to um, it's great to to have have such dedicated people um working on all our behalfs so um to wrap up i want to say a really huge thank you 
I've learned an awful lot. I hope that people who were listening um, took an awful lot of, from, from it. Um, the basic is to empower yourself, to check yourself, be the, be the first port of call on your own health. Um, and, and then hopefully you won't need professors and doctors. But if you do, we're in really good hands. So um, I want to thank you all. Thank you for your time. And um, we'll, 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 say good, we'll say good night to everybody. And Teresa, I'll give you the final word. Yeah, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, you're all amazing people. Um, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm here today he- he- healthy and happy because of people like you and the work that you do. So I want to thank everybody who attended tonight as well. It's been informative. Um, my final words would be check your breasts once a month if you have them. Men, women, everybody. Be breast aware. Take ownership of your breast health and educate yourself. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Take care and rest. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Have a good evening.